bacterial or optically active surfaces and uh, cause uh, degradation. The other is they do not have any protective or thermal uh, design. Close to sun, it can get as heated to as high as 130 degrees Celsius. And when it is in eclipse, Uh, the geosolar arrays uh, uh, usually see around uh, 1,400 thermal cycles in its lifetime, whereas uh, the Leo um, solar arrays in uh, low Earth orbits uh, with a life of five years, it can see as high as 30,000 thermal cycles. This kind of uh, temperature excursion as well as the temperature cycling, which the solar array sees, can cause many damages like uh, delamination of bond interface, cuts in the interconnects, and many other fatigue failures. Another type of uh, degradation that we see is the particle radiation. Uh, the particle radiation is caused by the trapped uh, energetic particles like electrons, like protons, uh, alpha particle, heavy ions in the Earth's uh, magnetic. surfaces and uh, differential charging due to the space plasma interaction with the solar cells, which can result in, in uh, differential charging, discharge, arcing, and uh, can result in uh, power losses. So can we move to the next slide? So once we have this much of uh, uh, in hostile atmosphere, or, or hostile environment, we need to design the solar array and uh, we attack it by selecting good material, good processes, and uh, good uh, test and uh, qualification uh, regimes. So first I'll uh, talk about the material selection. These are the eight categories that we usually see when we select a material to be used in the solar array. The material should be having low outgassing. Whatever material we use, they should have matched uh, thermal expansion coefficients so that uh, the where, during the both extremes, uh, they do not have create uh, stresses in the interfaces. We generally select uh, resins and adhesives with uh, low uh, glass transition temperatures. Uh, we also select our uh, metal parts, interconnects, bus bar, wires, everything with long fatigue life. Uh, we look for uh, superior electrical, mechanical, and thermal properties, radiation tolerance, low weight, as well as we look for uh, heritage processes. Heritage in the sense it should have some success in the previous or uh, some space usage that we also that also we weigh very much. Next, please. Now, coming to processes, uh, the solar array manufactured for space, it has very limited process options because the solar cells involved are very fragile and thin. Uh, we cannot have uh, heavy duty processes and uh, whatever process we adopt uh, for realizing the solar array, it goes through a design of experiments to understand what are all the uh, parameters that is within control and what are all the parameters which is out of control. We also do a process parameter optimization and the process parameter optimized undergoes through a full life cycle uh, and qualification test. Uh, when we realize the flight hardware, we uh, put a very tight uh, process control. We have very highly skilled manpower. They are very highly skilled and techni uh, trained technicians uh, who are uh, um, well versed with uh, these uh, specific pro special processes. We also incorporate in quality checks. We have an online QA. We have we make in process destructive coupons uh, to ensure that the process is under control without uh, damaging the uh, without uh, tampering with the actual hardware. We also look for, as I told, uh, heritage uh, processes and uh, heritage uh, um, applications when we change over uh, when we uh, realize the hardware, and uh, we also try to upkeep with the new requirements. As and when a new mission requirement comes, uh, we try to. Uh, update ourselves. 
Uh, here I would like to mention that other than ISRO and uh, the subcontractor which we have, uh, we are working with right now, no other uh, industry in India is uh, well versed with uh, the realization of space solar array. This can be due to the special processes and uh, which is completely different from the other electronic package manufacturing that we see in the industry. Uh, these processes are specific and also we require uh, multidisciplinary uh, expertise like uh, physicists, chemists, uh, material experts and uh, mechanical engineers to properly design and realize uh, solar panel. So uh, here, uh, till now the market uh, also was very small. Uh, we were uh, having uh, limited missions, but with the space sector opening up, I really believe that the industry has a very good uh, uh, opportunity here to uh, imbibe this uh, technology so that more and more research and more and more uh, orient uh, that is uh, sophisticated uh, space solar arrays are uh, rolled out by our, in our own industry. Can we go to the next, uh, please? So uh, here I would like to say what, what are all the qualification and characterization tests that we usually do for our uh, space solar arrays. Uh, the first three um, bullets are the uh, international standards that the solar cell used in space has to uh, get tested and qualified. Uh, in addition to this, we also have our internal uh, testing and qualification standards as per our ISRO standards. These uh, uh, include uh, part qualification, process optimization, life test, acoustic and vibration test, uh, and uh, other tests uh, as and when it is required uh, for the mission. Like uh, sometimes we do the arc tracking test and atomic oxygen protection. All these things are uh, uh, generally done. The new qualification strategy is uh, usually decided if some changes are there in the material process or uh, tools. Uh, and we have a we have a concept and we follow the concept like a test as we fly. The test hardware we try to keep it as identical to the flight hardware so that there are no surprises as we move ahead to the flight hardware. Next, please. So here I just uh, want to conclude how we are uh, keeping the reliability of our space solar array. We always uh, tend to predict the launch and onboard condition well in advance. We identify the space environment that the array has to see once it gets launched. And so that has access configuration and as much as we can say, the case as possible, we do not address new situations and new requirements by designing the qualification and test plan. We analyze and uh, protect uh, the array against uh, the known failure modes. Uh, parallelly, we make option and we, uh, in, in spite of this, we build a dependency satellite option inevitable in in space uh, industry. That's my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Uh, that was helpful. Uh, so I think we should quickly move on to the next person. We will have um, a small Q&A session at the end of this. So um, I think we can all reserve our questions to them and we will we'll make it more interactive. Um, so we now have Mr. Kulsar Thasi from uh, Central Therm in Germany, and he's going to be presenting on advanced equipment. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Mr. Thasi. Mr. Joseph. Hi, so. Can you hear yes, me now? Yes, I can. I think you were just on mute. I will. Okay, okay, that is fine. I think that's because um, I have the control for this. Okay. So, uh, 
we start? Yes, we can start. <laughs> to present our time uh, in this conference. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, the uh, organization team. I want to talk a little bit about the developments in the advanced equipment for high volume production, which is used for PERC and technologies beyond PERC. Next slide, please. Uh, I, just a short outline of my talk. It's first I will talk, uh, uh, give a brief introduction to Central Therm. Then I look what what is the market demand, the equipment. Then I will discuss in detail the equipments, piece CVD and diffusion, and give a short summary. Next, please. Uh, Central Therm is a leading supplier uh, in, in the uh, solar cell equipment and production solutions for crystalline solar cells. We are active in India for more than 35 years, supplying our customers in semiconductor and solar industry. Our experience in solar is more than 40 years and in turnkey solutions more than 15 years. And we have a high number of installed production lines and equipments. We are about uh, 1,500 furnaces for PCVD and about 1,000 furnaces for diffusion, which are out there in the market. And we are the expert for thermal and deposition equipment for solar cell technology and solar cell production lines. When we look, Originally, then it separated and get more into the high volume throughput. What I always mention is semiconductor does the best for every wafer. Solar does the necessary for the maximum amount of wafers. And what we now profit from is our semiconductor experience is with high efficiency solar cell applications more and more semiconductor problems are also moving over to solar cell manufacturing. We have also a group of uh, partners in the research community like Brownover, ISFH, ISC, and the University of Constance. And we are always looking to find a partner in India for the further developments. Next slide, please. When we look at our references, so it's a little bit Something happened to it. Uh, we have all the major on the left side, all the major uh, Indian manufacturers are our customers and we have supplied them with equipment and they are using this to be successful in the market. On the right side, you see another as uh, the other refer uh, selected references. Continue, please. Now I will have shortly a look at the market. And when we look there at the IRTP roadmap, which is a picture of the opinions of the major manufacturers in the world and also some equipment makers. And then we see for the next 10 years, the market will be dominated by PERC, Pearl, PERT, and Topcon cells. This is a group of technologies that uses a very similar equipment set for manufacturing. This means it's also, that's why we focus on this area. And this is also why it is so dominant because it, it's the most cost-effective manufacturing, which is currently known. Next, please. Important, what's the most important thing is that we the, oh, that's not really working. Uh, that the market is driven by cost per kilowatt hours. We have to do everything to bring this number down. And this means, especially because more and more for solar products are sold.
experience over this long period of uh, installation, manufacturing, and production. It's a proven workhouse and still a benchmark for competitors new equipment. Uh, the PCVD system can be used for PERC, TopCon, as it can uh, de deposit all the major layers that are needed in this technology, from aluminum oxide to nitride down to polysilicon. Wafer size range is uh, M6, M10, and M12 as the standard. Other sizes are available optionally as they are in this range. Next, please. When we look at the machines, the, on the left side, the C plasma is a machine which can handle 156 to 166 millimeter wafers. That's a machine you are quite aware of and uh, you well know. Uh, it has a 352 millimeter boat and five tubes. The next generation is the Plasma X, which can handle 166, 182, and 210 millimeters. So it's safe for the next wafer sizes. It uses 10 tubes, and from the boat size for 166, it's still the 352, 294 for 182, and 240 for uh, 210. We have also a very low consumption of TMA in the systems, which is less than six milligram per wafer. And when you look at the cost of ownership, if I set the basic system to 100%, you can save with the Plasma X about, which is a, it's a bigger system, which can handle 416, 350, and 288 wafers, depending on M6, 10, and 12. And there you can save between 20 and 30%. Next, please. Here you see just what this means in megawatt when I take our standard processes. The small one, which had about 150 megawatts in our logs, and the plasma X about 300 and 300 megawatts. And this is quite independent of the wafer size as the area of the graphite plates in the graphite boat are different wafer sizes. And if you go to the plasma XL, the next extension, then we run about 350 megawatts. Next. When we look at nitride, it's a quite similar machine. The capacity compared to the Alox. This is because the uh, stack process for Alox nitride is about 10% longer in pro processing time. Next, please. This means we have, we have the new tool set we have now established in the market. Uh, already up to M12 wafer size, which means 210 millimeters. We have a higher throughput, a high process flexibility, easy to implementation of new process requirements, quite important to secure the your investment. Because of high quality components, special exhaust separation concept, which will save several amount of money on the handling of the waste gas, especially for TMA, silane, and ammonia, and nitrous oxide, a lower total consumption of all You can bring a significantly higher amount. Higher. Next, please. Now we move to diffusion. Here you see it's even more 
All severe from a diffusion furnace 2007 to have about an 18 times higher capacity on the machine. It's also the same machine, industry standard now available for atmospheric and low pressure processes, proven workhouse, still benchmark for competitors. And the diffusion processes that are the standard that is phosphorus, boron diffusion, oxidation, and annealing, and wafer size similar to the PCVD M6, M10, and M12 meters. Next, please. When we look here, it's, it's quite similar. When we look at the machine, you already know, it's 156 to 166 millimeter wafer. It has about 1,000 wafers per tube. We move to the diff X, which has about one, uh, 1,600 wafers and 10 tubes for 166 to 182 millimeter wafers. And if you go to two 10 millimeter wafers, we have 10 tubes, but we have only 1,200 wafers in a boat. There's a, spa there's a bigger spacing required to compensate the depletion to the center of the wafer. We have also here a significant cost of ownership reduction. Next slide, please. When we look at the throughput, it's even more amazing. When the old machine had about 182 megawatt defects, we have about 600 to 700 megawatt throughput in one machine. And for the, this is all for the Pockel diffusion. If you look at the boron diffusion, there's still only the five tube system. We have de developed a process for the 10 tube system. We had so far no request from any customer for these wafer sizes. Next, please. to get the system more stable, to get the process variation smaller as it is required now for the newer high efficiency processes. Lower total consumption in Pockel, reduced manpower, lower maintenance costs, and also the same, less machines means less handlings, less tubing, everything. And the reduced floor space again helps capacity in the same space. Next, please. Now, let me come to a short summary. Suitable for all uh, equipment suitable for all cell technologies. Changes between technologies are, require only small modifications, and this means. The equipment lifetime is, is extended. This means your investment that is, can be used for a longer time. The standard processes are PERC with aluminum oxide, TOPCON with polysilicon, with PCVD poly on N type, POLO, also polysilicon passivated contact, using is this a misprint LPCVD polysilicon on P type. Then we have the Bison N type bifacial cell in zebra and n-type bifacial IBC cell. And there are a lot of other modifications of these processes around. High process flexibility, easy implementation of new requirements, and our processes are free of IP violations. We have the lowest total cost of ownership and the lowest floor space requirements. Next, please. Just when we look in the NRL uh, chart with the highest efficiencies, then you see there's two red marks, are, the red dots are a little bit disturbed. We have the ISFH with the Polo, which is a lead, uh, has a lead in the efficiency, and we have the IFS, Fraunhofer, Ease,
and the Polo cell is using our LPCVD polysilicon passivation for the high efficiency cells. Next, please. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Mr. Haas. Uh, so I think we're just going to quickly move on. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I understand you. You talk to me or? On screen film technology. Okay. Uh, my name is Kuntal Kumar Verma. Uh, I'll be talking about first solar thin film technology, our product uh, cattle value differentiation, manufacturing, and a brief insight. What is the next slide? So first solar is a multi gigawatt thin film based uh, solar panel manufacturer with 25 gigawatts of solar modules uh, shipped worldwide. Um, we have global footprints in USA, Asia, and the two R&D centers in, in uh, Ohio and California. We make material system and our manufacturing technologies that goes into the making of the panels. Uh, is our key differentiator. Uh, we have weathered the ups and downs in the solar market by staying focused in our uh, balanced business model without compromising on liquidity and profitability. Uh, our long-term vision is to excel in technology and cost leadership, uh, leading the world's uh, sustainable energy future. So the next slide. This, uh, uh, the nameplate of our current modules are in the range of uh, 420 to 450 watts. Uh, these modules, they demonstrate uh, better temperature coefficient. Uh, they have uh, best in the industry, unmatched uh, spect spectral performance, uh, true tracking, and reducing soiling related performance losses. Go to the next slide. So the nameplate, um, power at 25 C in a controlled atmosphere is far removed from what the panel actually uh, sees in real life. In field, the panel is covered in dust, atmosphere, and humidity that changes, uh, it changes the spectrum and the panel operating at temperatures also above, sometimes at above uh, 40 C. As the resistance of the material increases at higher temperatures, so our panel performance comes down. It is nowhere close to the label on the panel. Consider your car or scooter mileage uh, uh, in a smooth, flat road with no port portals or traffic versus driving in a traffic in an Indian city. Um, mileage and performance are two very different things. So the graph here compares a first solar cattail panel at uh, standard uh, operating conditions and the efficiency as measured versus the actual power output that you see on the right under field-like conditions. And you can see the first solar module compares to other solar modules. Uh, comparisons are coming from solar module super loop providers. Uh, our technology development effort is to maximize uh, um, the area under the curve to maximize energy. Uh, go to the next slide. So a quick overview of our technology evolution. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, First Solar developed and perfected a high throughput process uh, to apply device quality cattail semiconductor sheets of glass. Later in the decade, we optimized our manufacturing flow and we fortified our supply chain uh, to beat the $1 per watt benchmark in 2009. Uh, next decade, uh, the team pivoted to focus on device stack uh, Cattle semiconductor quality, front contact and back contact um, uh, improvements followed as we broke 
device performance benchmarks every year. One reason First Solar was able to maintain leadership was its ability to translate lab results to pilot um, and NHVM in quick order. In 2017, First Solar uh, launched the a large form factor series six panel, which retooled, uh, it retooled at factories in USA, Malaysia, and launched two new factories in Vietnam. Um, we ramped to six gigawatts in the next two years. As we examine competition in, 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 in crystalline silicon space, um, monopork, bifacial, N-type, we are also pivoting to prepare the next round of device improvements. And, and Cure is, is a backbone of that. Uh, go to the next slide. A, a brief description, uh, description of our uh, uh, Cure next-gen uh, technology. Um, so devices at the heart of a solar panel require controlled amounts of uh, certain elements called dopants. Uh, silicon uses boron, phosphorus, arsenic, etc. Uh, cattle has traditionally used copper. Uh, while copper is essential to make the device work, but it also plays a big role uh, in degradation in the field. Uh, for solar, so recently uh, announced arsenic as a copper replacement doping. What makes it so exciting for us is the demonstration of a device that show little to no degradation. And I stress that emulates field. Um, technology development teams is currently, uh, they're pulling all stops uh, uh, to get into this, into manufacturing. And we truly believe this will be a paradigm shifting product. Uh, combine this with the NOCT performance uh, I discussed in the previous slides. Uh, we firmly believe that we have a product that will be the best in the marketplace for utility scale production. Go to the next slide. So what about the future? Um, what do the physicists uh, say? Uh, crystal and silicon is limited to max efficiency based on fundamental material property limitations. Uh, Cattail is not even close to it. Um, to close to its entitlement. Uh, we have a demonstrated material capability that gives us visibility to closer to 23 to 25 percent efficiency. Uh, in fact, silicon world is pivoting to thin films and evaluating strategies to marry thin films with silicon, uh, with silicon using technologies like perovskites. Uh, we believe we are strategically, uh, strategically placed um, due to our know-how with thin films to exploit that better. Go to the next slide. So what does next decade hold for Cartel? As, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, our effort in the next few years is to introduce and further improve our pure platform to reach its potential in the mid term. Uh, further, our advanced research team are diligently working towards the next frontier of Cartel improvements to create a roadmap to bridge the gap of theoretical maximum. And, and, and that's what our most of our efforts will be in the next uh, in in the next decade. Go to the next slide. This slide shows a layout of our state of the art manufacturing line. Uh, it's a 2.5 gigawatt production plant uh, housed under one roof, uh, fully automated, uh, connected layout, uh, deploying advanced process control, industry 4.0 standards, um, tightly controlled process ensuring consistent quality and reliability of our product. And, and, and tool only CapEx in the low teens in terms of cents per watt. Uh, ECO glass is fed at one end, uh, which you see on the left uh, and, and uh, on the top left. And then within less than 4.5 hours, this layout will be churning out modules every 16 to 18 seconds. And for solar also recycles all its scrap. Uh, it generates in the factory and also offers this same facil uh, facilities to its customer at a normal price. So how does it compare uh, with crystalline value stream? Uh, multiple product development, 20 plus products, 100 plus bombs, multiple factories, increased variability and quality and reliability risk. Uh, even PV Tech says that the tier one um, players, 40 to 80% uh, of their bomb 
is not uh, is only traceable uh, with their fragmented supply base, which has a greater risk profile. Go to the next slide. Please go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so, so we all get excited about uh, green energy. Um, it is easy to forget that most of the grid is still supplied by fossil fuels, which are necessary to support the base load. Uh, so let us see how a thin film compares to crystal silicon energy payback. Um, for solar generates the energy that was used to produce them uh, in less than five months. That is four times faster uh, than monocrystalline. If you factor in the water consumption and, and recyclability, I'll let you decide what is truly green. Um, so overall, our sustainability scorecard bears uh, very well against our crystal silicon. And uh, that was my last slide. And I'll be open for questions in there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Verma, for the presentation. Uh, and now we're just going to move on uh, to the next speaker, who is Mr. Peter, and he is from IEA PVPS from Austria, and he is going to be presenting on. Are you ready, Mr. Peter? Hello. Hi. I'm just going to hand it over. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy um, that a topic like BIPV can present in such a technology focused uh, session. Um, I'm Peter Illich. I'm a researcher at the University of Applied Sciences, Technicum Vienna, and in this function, I'm acting as the operating agent from uh, the task 15 from the International Energy PVPS. Technolo technology collaboration program. Uh, next slide, please. When uh, talking about uh, building integrating, integrated photovoltaics, um, we are talking about a multifunctional technology as a part of the building skin, enabling uh, not only the energy active uh, part of PV, the electricity production, but also uh, other functionalities um, for the building and the built environment, such as you can see in this slide here, um, such as providing shading or sun protection, um, heat and cold management, uh, weather protection, and above all, uh, PV uh, used as an aesthetic building design element and thus uh, enabling to increase the acceptance in a large scale uh, penetration of PV in the built environment. Next slide, please. So BIPV, Building Integrated Photovoltaics, is on the one hand a building or construction product, and at the same time an energy producer. So we are dealing with a technology that at least uh, serves uh, as a dual functional uh, uh, product. Um, and um, when Talking about BIPV and BIPV modules and systems, um, we established uh, a certain definitions uh, that serve as basis for regulatory uh, frameworks uh, on an international level. Um, you can see uh, the, the picture of the publication from um, the IEA PVPS. Uh, what is important is that BIPV uh, and as a module uh, is um, and its dual duality and dual function multifunctionality is serving as as an integrated part of the building. And if a BIPV product is dismantled or removed from a built uh, environment or from a building, it would have to be replaced by a suitable uh, construction uh, product. Next slide, please. Um, within the International Energy uh, Agency, uh, TCP of the Photovoltaic uh, Power System Program, um, we are working uh, on, on, on certain tasks um, together with in, in all uh, 27 countries uh, with the goal to enhance the international collaborative efforts uh, which facilitate the role of PV uh, as a cornerstone in the energy transition. 
competition. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the uh, tasks within the IEA PPS uh, TCP is uh, the so-called task 15, uh, where we are working on an enabling framework for the development of the IPV uh, with the objective to create an enabling framework that accelerates the penetration of BIPV products on the global market. Uh, next slide, please. Our approach um, is a value-added approach um, as uh, BIPV is related to both the electric uh, technology and also the building construction technology. Therefore, um, within task 15, we are dealing with topics related, uh, of course, to uh, PV technology itself, but also uh, with topics related to the building um, and in close collaboration with the building industry. So the scope uh, of, of our uh, initiative In our range of things and best practice examples, new and existing buildings. We are dealing with uh, different PV technologies. One family dwellings to large scale BIPV applications, uh, such as in offices and utility buildings. Uh, next slide, please. of task 15, we uh, aim to help stakeholders, such as uh, from the building sector, the energy sector, uh, but also from public, governmental and financial sector, but also uh, from uh, R&D uh, institutes uh, all over the world to overcome technical and non-technical barriers uh, with regard to the implementation of BIPV uh, in the built environment. And uh, we develop uh, processes, methods, and tools uh, to assist them. Next slide, please. Who are we? We are uh, over 40 experts coming from about 17 countries uh, in different sectors, as I just mentioned, uh, such as uh, R&D, but also BIPV industry, uh, partners are involved within task 15. Uh, we have experts coming from the building sector, architecture, and uh, so on, um, uh, working together uh, on this aspect. Um, thank you. So uh, let's uh, get to the future. Um, BIPV allows us to redesign the world and integrate energy into our built environment and landscapes. Next slide, please. But why is it so important to talk about, about PV in the built environment? As we all know, uh, the building sector is responsible for a big part of global end use energy consumption and, and uh, direct and indirect CO2 emissions, uh, which uh, makes it uh, a very important topic to talk about. And as we all know, um, glo globally, there have been uh, or are many political statements and directives that have been moving further towards reducing the impact of buildings uh, in the energy sector, uh, such as keywords like uh, zero energy buildings, communities, and cities. Next slide, please. This makes uh, PV in the built environment and built in the building sector itself um, not only the cause of, of a problem, but also a potential source of solutions via integrating PV in the built environment. Um, of course, also considering uh, um, the multifunctionality, energy active building envelopes, use of already built environment, or uh, self-consumption issues, or uh, local generation of electricity close to consumers. Next slide, please. 
So the boundary conditions and initiatives uh, globally, they look very uh, promising uh, as, and that present a very promising background for the BIPV uh, market uptake. However, um, a major fraction of, of the potential for BIPV still remains unused, which uh, is mainly uh, because uh, the presence of, for example, proven diversity of, of technology, um, uh, best practice examples, numerous successful examples, uh, uh, new innovative uh, BIPV products with a larger degree of design freedom for architects, um, they are still not sufficient to foster large and self-sustaining BIPV market um, for applications, as you can see in the figure on the uh, right side of this slide. Um, one example of BIPV, yep, next slide, thank you. <laughs> um, one example of product diversity and design uh, freedom, uh, degree of design freedom for architects is, for example, as an, an example in my presentation today, uh, the coloring of uh, BIPV products. Uh, here, you, here you have different uh, opportunities like colored cells, colored glass foils, and printing and coating on glass, uh, where already uh, uh, many products are available on uh, the BIPV uh, market. Next slide, please. Of course, then uh, leading to uh, a field of tension between uh, efficiency and aesthetics. So uh, asking the question, which uh, or how, mu how much of the performance do we want to sacrifice uh, for uh, design aspects, color, transparency, aesthetical aspects? Next slide, please. Uh, these questions and other uh, uh, questions uh, we are dealing with and working on within uh, task 15 which is already has already been ongoing since 2016 um, where we were working within several subtasks and working groups on uh, as I mentioned just now the product diversity re reliability and technology aspects but also uh, we were dealing a lot with topics like uh, standardization and the legal and regulatory framework we were uh, and are continuously working on uh, digitalization and uh, BIM uh, for BIPV. Um, currently, we are um, developing an assessment method for the environmental impact of uh, BIPV products. Um, a broad market introduction will, of course, also require uh, certain business models and a collection of best practice examples on an international scale. Thank you. You can find uh, first publications of, over the, that we published over the last years uh, on our IEA PVPS uh, homepage. Um, some of them are dealing uh, with uh, very uh, technology uh, focused uh, topics. Um, currently, we are in the second phase of task 15. It has started in the beginning of uh, 2020 and runs until uh, 2023. Next slide, please. And uh, for the second phase of uh, task 15, we have, uh, thank you, <laughs> we have uh, identified uh, what is our vision? Where do we want to go? Uh, what do we want to uh, reach? We want that BIPV contributes significantly to the renewable energy system and sustainable buildings, which is why we identified a vision uh, on a multidisciplinary level based on our state of the art. And as you can see in the slide right now, uh, still existing issues like, for example, uh, the multifunctional ev evaluation uh, of BIPV as a uh, product, but also uh, the standardization and regulatory framework. Um, is still to be harmonized on an international level. Next slide, please. This is uh, 
why uh, we are working uh, also now within task 15 and the second phase of task 15 uh, in a very multidisciplinary approach and broad approach on uh, to to overcome uh, the issues and uh, reach our vision and this is one of is my last slide um, the current uh, division of our work within task 15 where we are working on the one hand on the technological innovation system approach uh, and analysis for BIPV. Um, we are uh, very uh, uh, much uh, dealing with the cross-sectional anal analysis of uh, existing BIPV installations. We are working on BIPV guidelines and dealing with topic digitalization for BIPV. And as I mentioned before, uh, dealing with pre-normative international research on the character on characterization methods for uh, building integrated photovoltaics. And with this, uh, I come to the end of my presentation and I will be very happy if you contact me uh, if you have any questions with regard to our work from Task 15 in the IEA PVPS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I would like to just um, went on. Uh, now we're going to move on for the next presentation. And um, we have uh, first solo. I'm oh, sorry, we have Linton Crystal who's going to be presenting from uh, USA. And we have Ms. Lakshmi with us for the presentation. Uh, are you ready? Ready. Oh, great. All right. So, uh, uh, my name is Ron Kramer, and I'll be your host for the next few minutes. Uh, we are Linton Crystal Technologies, and we're going to. To, uh, talk about mono production technology today. First, I want to thank uh, uh, the uh, conference for inviting us. Um, next slide. Uh, with us today uh, on the uh, call, we have uh, Todd Barnum, our CEO of U.S. Operations, uh, John Sear our senior process engineer, and he'll be answering questions in the question and answer session, uh, as well as our rep in India, International Marketing Corporation, Prashant Shaw and Makaran, let me get this right, Nagar Kar. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to be discussing the Shukrovsky process uh, from monocrystalline ingot production, and then we're going to do uh, show you an example of one of the furnaces that we manufacture, uh, the KX360 PV. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, for over 60 years, Linton Crystal has designed, developed, and manufactured CZ furnaces. Uh, formerly known as KX, Linton is a world leader in CZ system production with over 5,000 furnaces uh, installed worldwide. Uh, you need to, you're gonna need to click three times to go through this. Uh, we service the semiconductor market, the solar market, and what we call the specialty market. Uh, the semiconductor and solar markets uh, are primarily silicon product. Uh, the specialty, uh, we manufacture machines, CZ growers, uh, for germanium, gallium arsenide, INSB, a host of other uh, materials. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, our senior staff has uh, over 250 hours combined of experience uh, in engineering and manufacturing. Uh, with that, uh, Linton is the world uh, leader uh, in CZ expertise. Uh, we have a full line of furnaces uh, from a 22 inch uh, hot zone up to 36 inch hot zone. Uh, and that really uh, will determine uh, your productivity uh, of the machines. Uh, next. Okay, the Shikorsky process. So, uh, the Shikorsky process, like any good, uh, um, uh, any good technology, was developed accidentally. Uh, Mr. Shikorsky. He was working in a lab. Uh, he had his pen out. He went to go put it back in a holder, dipped it inside of a, a molten tin, and when he pulled it out, he looked at the tip, and there was a, a crystal growing. And that's how that started. Uh, next. So there's a 10-step process uh, in the manufacturing of a 
monocrystalline ingot. Uh, the first is charging. Uh, what we'll do is we'll take a, a crucible, a quartz crucible, and we'll add uh, rock silicon to it. Uh, the rock silicon will be added in various sizes uh, from manufacturers like Volker, Hemlock Semiconductor, or REC silicon. Um, into that also uh, will be added a dopant. Uh, uh, boron is typically used uh, for that. Uh, next slide. Then we go into a melting process where we turn that solid into a liquid. Uh, we heat the uh, silicon up. It melts at about 420 C. The furnace is capable of going up to 1500 C. Did I say 1400? 1420, sorry. Uh, going up to 1500 C or higher. Uh, next. Following that, we go into what's called a stabilization process. In the stabilization process, we make sure that that we've uh, burned off all the impurities, we've outgassed, uh, we've melted any particles that may be hanging on the side of the crucible. Um, we get it to a, a point of not boiling, but not cooling. And typically a, a good process engineer can look inside of a viewport and, and determine where this is with their eye. Uh, we are also working right now with our systems to have cameras be able to detect this uh, portion of the process. Uh, next step. In the next step, we drop a uh, seed or we dip a seed into the melt. After we dip that seed into the melt, we once again wait for uh, a stabilization process. That seed is typically uh, the material you want to grow. So in this case, uh, we'll take a seed, a monocrystalline seed, and we'll dip it into uh, the melt. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next step would be uh, to grow a neck. Uh, a neck uh, is typically about uh, four to six millimeters in diameter and up to 190 millimeters in length. Uh, that neck will support the crystal that is being grown um, as we pull it uh, into the receiving chamber. Uh, next slide. This step is the crown process. Uh, the crown process is basically starting to get the uh, crystal to grow to the diameter you'd want. Uh, so when you're growing M6, M12, the different sizes, um, you might be looking at 215, 230, uh, plus 260, 300 millimeter. Um, so you're now starting to fan out uh, and develop what we call a crown. Uh, next slide. From there, we round it off into uh, a shoulder. The shoulder will then lead into the body. Uh, this is a critical step again, to make sure that we have a proper diameter uh, when growing the crystal. Uh, next step. Okay, this is the body. Uh, this is basically where the wafers will come from. Uh, the body uh, has four facets um, that must be, again, there are various structure uh, consistencies that you must have, and, and uh, facets are one of them, as well as a, a good diameter control. Um, Let's see, what anything else say about body? Uh, current body lengths run anywhere from three to four meters. Uh, some of the bigger manufacturers, uh, the Long G's, the GCL's, those guys are looking to go to uh, four to five uh, meters and uh, five to seven meters uh, for the future. So these uh, ingots are getting longer and longer. Uh, and the reason for that is as long as you have the machine heated up, uh, and you don't have to start and stop it, uh, you can cut down on uh, power requirements by just adding more material to the melt and then pulling longer uh, ingots and therefore creating a better efficiency in manufacturing. Uh, next. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong uh, when you're manufacturing an ingot. Um, temperature, argon flow, uh, crucible handling, whether it's centered properly or not, um bubbling uh again i'm not going to read them all to you but basically uh this is a a, a highly complex uh growth uh and uh you've got to watch out for a lot of different uh, issues that could pop up next the final step uh is growing a tail and this is equally as important uh in the crystal in that uh if you shock the crystal at any time 
uh, you could ruin the quality of the crystal, ruin, uh, this is a, uh, again, a single, uh, a single cell crystal, uh, and you don't want to have uh, any shock to it. It'll, it'll, it'll uh, ruin the crystal. So you need to tail this off to a point, a fine point, when you pull that fine point out of what's left of the melt. Um, next slide. Okay, how we do this? Uh, we use uh, a machine. Currently, the machine uh, industry standard uh, is our KX360 series. Uh, and the KX360 uh, is a 1,400-millimeter tank capable of handling a, handling a 36-inch crucible. A 36-inch crucible can handle about 600 kilos of melt. Um, that machine can then generate 8 to 10 megawatts of power a year. So if you're looking to do a one gigawatt factory, you'll need approximately 120 machines, give or take. Uh, each one of these machines uh, has a footprint of about three meters by three meters on the floor, and then stands about 12 meters tall. So you'll need a building that's about 15 meters, let's say, because you need to open the machine, and you'll also need an overhead crane for installation uh, and uh, any maintenance on the machines. Uh, next slide. Um, again, this machine is designed uh, for four meter plus crystals. So it has receiving chambers of 5,000 to 7,000 millimeters. It can handle a variety of hot zones. Uh, 28 inch is a current standard. People are moving to 32 and 36 uh, for the future, again, for pulling those longer ingots. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we supply the machine with a full controls package. Uh, our controls package. Uh, uh, is the most, most in-depth in the industry. Um, we use a Siemens PLC controller to control the furnace. And then we have two uh, PCs, one for our KICS or Crystal Vision system, which is again, a vision system, uh, which uh, allows you to uh, check diameter uh, as well as other um, uh, parts of the crystal as it grows. Uh, and then we have a data collection software package called WINGS, uh, and that allows you to collect data on the run so you can review the data later on to see if there was a problem and where that problem was and what happened and how to fix it, uh, as well as send recipes or SOPs to the machines. And I'll show you a slide about that later. Uh, next slide. Okay, the machine is consisted of, of a few different uh, highly technical parts. One of them is the seed lift. Uh, the seed lift uh, has to be able to uh, lift the crystal uh, as it grows out of the uh, melt. Um, this particular seed lift has a capacity of 800 kilograms. Um, I think that's, and is uh, dynamically balanced. Balancing is very important, uh, especially as you're pulling longer crystals. Uh, you're gonna want uh, to eliminate or, or reduce orbiting as much as possible. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the receiving chamber, as I mentioned before. Uh, you know, we standardize it at 5,000 millimeters, but it can be custom sized to fit your building, uh, shorter or longer. Uh, it can also be customized uh, with uh, different uh, doors on it for clean out ports or uh, seed, uh, seed cable alignment, which is what this machine has at the top and at the bottom. Uh, next slide. Uh, we use a pendulum style isolation valve, and what this allows you to do is isolate the receiving chamber from the uh, tanks. So if you have a hot molten lava uh, in a tank, uh, pull the crystal, close the valve, keep the put more, put it, put what's called a, uh, a torpedo or a, a quartz tube filled with additional silicon into the receiving chamber, close the machine up, open up the valve, drop the additional uh, silicon into the already hot pot, and turn and cool off the machine and restart it up again, which is where it uses your most power. So you can consistently re refill the crucible as long as it lasts and pull additional ingots out using this isolation valve. Uh, next. Uh, we use a two tank system, an upper tank and a lower tank. Uh, this particular tank, again, is 1400 millimeters inside diameter. 
Uh, it has a viewport on the top. It has a feeder port on the top. Um, um, it splits in half again for uh, in order to load and unload crucibles as well as cleaning uh, the system. Uh, next. And this is the crucible lift. This is another important part of the uh, the machine. Uh, as you pull the, cru the crystal out of the, the pot, uh, you need to consistently move uh, the crucible up. Uh, you don't want the crystal to pop itself out of the melt. So as you're pulling material out and there's less material in the bowl, uh, you need to have a, a highly technical uh, piece of equipment that would, again, push that uh, uh, crucible up and and this is our uh, crucible lift system next slide uh, this is the wings uh, collector i was talking about before uh, this allows you it's a hardware and software package that we uh, supply with the machine um, and this allows you to uh, network many machines together so let's say you have a one gigawatt 120 machines uh, loaded and you've got four different customers that are requiring ingots of different size or, or different uh, um, uh, different carbon content, oxygen content, uh, whatever the requirements may be from that particular customer. Uh, you can load those SOP, SOPs uh, from one location into the various machines and get them ready uh, for. So you can take 30 machines and make, make them identical for that particular customer or 60 machines uh, for an additional customer. Uh, using our wings package and then again it will collect the data from all the runs so you can evaluate the data at a later time uh, next slide um, in addition to the machines we also offer all the accessories that go with the machines we uh, custom design uh, the feeding tube uh, which is on the left uh, if you need a cooling tube the second item uh, cathetometers for measuring the crystal length uh, as well as all of the different crucible handling tools, uh, crystal handling tools that are all designed for factories. So we'll work with you with your factory to design all the additional accessories so they work with your factory. Uh, next slide. So, so in summary, uh, basically crystal growing is an art. Uh, it takes time to develop uh, uh, an SOP or a recipe that works for your customer. Um, there's many steps involved, uh, very critical steps uh, involved to grow a crystal. Uh, I like to say the uh, tech, you know, technically, in, in layman's terms, uh, uh, we have an oven, which is our KX360. We have a recipe, which somebody develops, and then we have a baker, which is the operator. So those three items working together are able to pull out uh, a perfect crystal. Right there, you see a crystal that's uh, a few meters long with perfect diameter control. Uh, a perfect crown at the top. You can't see the tail at the bottom. Um, so anyway, uh, we have a roadmap uh, within our company from three to five years from now to have a machine uh, that is fully automated. Uh, basically, we want to take our process engineers uh, or the process engineer that's that usually has to run a machine, and we want to put that into the intelligence of the machine. Uh, so the machine can now look at what a perfect crystal it grew one time and then continuously grow that crystal again without having to any interaction from an operator. Um, and next slide. And that's it. Uh, this is our Rep International Marketing Corporation. If anybody has any questions and would like to get in touch with our local rep in India, please contact uh, International Marketing. Thank you very much. I think we're done. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Uh, I would now quickly move on to the next presenter. We have Gang Cube. Uh, my apologies. This is going to be taken over by Ms. Lakshmi. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. I can start? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. to present about our innovation. Venkube is a solar R&D company based out of Bangalore. I am Lakshmi, principal engineer and co-founder at Venkube. Our primary innovation is an innovative solar glass for the solar panels that can boost the energy generation in the panel by 20% more. This is the snapshot of our flagship product. Next slide, please. Uh, 
the offer is a so even type of solar glass and as seen in this product uh, as seen in this figure uh, we have a unique design for the placement of the solar cells and the glass has a unique design traditionally a solar panel has a flat glass now we have replaced this flat glass with some kind of prismatic structure and between every row of solar cell there is now a gap that is introduced and in this gap we place the prisms and this prisms can collect more sunlight and redirect it to the solar cell and that's how we boost the energy generation in the panel and we have filed six patents on this unique design and this technology is not a retro Concept and is meant for green team deployments, primarily due to this unique positioning of the solar cells and the placement of the prisms. And in terms of the benefits, this glass will be a drop-in replacement of the flat glass that exists today in the manufacturing line, and there will be minimal change in the manufacturing line. And as we use glass, and there is absolutely zero moving parts, and it lasts long for 30 years. Hence, there is a long-term investment protection. Also, this is a technology that is totally agnostic to any type of solar cell technology. Our glass can coexist with poly, mono, perk, HIP, any type of solar cells, or even a bifacial solar panel or a thin film solar panel. And also, we have taken um, careful consideration while designing this prismatic structure so that there is no increase in soiling issues and also automatic cleaning by brushes is possible. Next slide, next slide please. So we have tested this prototype. We have done extensive simulation in standard industrial softwares and also we have tested this prototype in our office rooftop and collected the data. This graph here shows the energy gain for 365 days a year for the location Singapore, where we see that the rental panel gives a consistent 20% more than a traditional fixed panel. And this is irrespective of any season, be it winter, summer, or um, uh, spring or autumn season, we give this consistent 20% gain. Next slide, please. And we have done the study for across all geographies right from Singapore that was placed near the equator all the way to London at 50 degree north and we see that across all these latitudes the glass continues to perform well and gives 16 to 80 percent D. The primary factor that we leverage on is the tilt of the panel. The panel is tilted as per the latitude and the glass exists on top of the panel and gives this energy boost. Next slide please. So what is the with our panel with this extra energy generation. So this energy generation translates to a 20% revenue boost. And this revenue boost we give at an additional capital cost, which increases taking into account the panel cost, the cabling and the mounting structure cost, it increases by 10%. However, overall the cost of energy generation reduces by 12%. Next slide, please. So our panels are very well suitable for agri photovoltaic use case, primarily due to the uh, unique um, design of the panel and the way the cells are arranged, there is no penetration of light for crop um, growth underneath the panel, unlike the traditional panel which hinders sunlight considerably. So we offer dual land usage. So a farmer uh, today can use um, agri the land for agricultural cultivation and also give the land for solar developers to uh, rent out and earn extra money. And so the farmers can increase the income per acre by 15 to 60 percent more. And also because we generate extra power, there is a, uh, the CO2 emission reduction. This translates to planting 150 million trees for a 1 gigawatt scale. Next slide, please. So our journey so far, um, we have a physical prototype that's been validate, validated in our office rooftop and now we are partnered with IIT Bombay where we are conducting design for manufacturability and module reliability testing and also addressing other future research problems like soiling. 
and the, in terms of awards, uh, we recently uh, were selected as the South Asia finalist in the clean tech segment in Climate Launchpad event. And we got selected as the top 30 startup company in the EDF Pulse India 2020 and are waiting for the final results. We have been bootstrapped so far and we have got a grant from IAC. And we are, uh, we are currently being engaged in doing a pilot with Sun Medicine. And we are looking to partner with so more solar manufacturers going forward. Next slide. So thank you for this opportunity. We hope with our rented solar panels, we'll be able to accelerate the growth of solar in India with these indigenous panels. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, and now we move on to Sujan LTI. Uh, Mr. Rajesh Sujan will be presenting on floating solar modules. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, of course, I'd like to thank uh, MNRE and Niti Ayog for, uh, for creating this opportunity for all of us. I think it's a great platform. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation. I'm Rajesh. Uh, can you just um, go back? So. The company name is Sujan LTIRD Energy Private Limited. Uh, we have just uh, started operations uh, in India. Uh, the technology that we're bringing to the country is by the name of Sunrise Flotation Systems, and they're a company out of Taiwan. You can go to the next slide. Why floating uh, PV structures? Traditional structures, of course, have uh, a lot of issues in terms of um, a lot of issues in terms of land acquisition costs available availability of land um, and uh, you know really not suitable for densely populated areas uh, this is where floating pv actually comes in there's a lot of advantages here. Um, first first off of course you, you don't need land for it so the acquisition cost is gone uh, when you use uh, essentially dams and reservoirs you already have grid connection points in place and then uh, one of the most important aspects here is that it actually helps uh, the locals in the area by preventing evaporation losses uh, you know especially in drought prone areas so this is one of the key key aspects um, it has its advantages but there are difficulties also when it comes to floating solar uh, we have to worry about extreme weather conditions like hurricanes typhoons uh, basically so century storms which are actually not century storms anymore they're just coming every five years, every seven years. Uh, we have to worry about extreme wind loads, uh, rough and stormy weather, uh, water uh, and water level variations. So these are some of the big issues when, when it comes to FPV uh, structure. Go to the next page. Uh, this is actually where we come in. Uh, we're a group of companies. We are powered by Sunrise uh, ENT out of Taiwan. Uh, they are actually, um, I would say, the global leaders when it comes to designing flotation systems uh, they have about 25 years of experience designing and selling deep sea fish farming uh, and fish cage products uh, which actually work uh, in extreme weather conditions uh, dealing with currents and storms and varying water levels in the sea uh, they've also invented uh, and patented the solution for flotation uh, solu uh, flotation of uh, pv um, systems and they have almost eight years uh, of operational experience Experience, they have absolutely the highest megawatts installed in the world without any failure. The only company to do that. Um, and this is, again, coming back to the problem of uh, floating PV. Uh, when it comes to Sujan and LTI Re-Energy, uh, Sujan uh, is, uh, is basically a group uh, having 14 manufacturing locations uh, in, in the country, four joint ventures, two R&D centers, and over 40 years of manufacturing experience in polymer products mainly in automotive, railroad, and aerospace product lines. LTRE Energy is the, is the company with a lot of uh, renewable energy background, over 20 years of experience, and almost 50 years of inverter technology experience out of Germany. Go to the next, please. So why do existing floating PV structures in the market fail? And it's not one instance. Uh, over the course of the last two years, uh, since uh, floating PV has has become bigger uh, globally we've seen consistently uh, you know the, the existing designs failing left right and center uh, there's there's uh, instances in saga 
uh, Japan in 2019, and Hui China, uh, Fu Wan Bay Lake uh, in Hong Kong, Okigawa, Japan, and the biggest one last year, which was the Yamakura Dam um, in Japan in 2019. The wind speeds that these guys were dealing with uh, were pretty low uh, as compared to the wind speeds that we see in India, uh, and they were failing at at, at the range of about 41 to 42 meters per second. Uh, we believe that the reason is that there is a lot of inexperience when it comes to this market. It's a new market. The designs uh, and the technical standards in the industry and the tenders are just not up to the mark. And there's a lot of unforce unforeseen circumstances such as sensitive storms, which are leading to uh, these failures on FSPV projects. This actually leads to a lot of long-term insurance coverage risks, and it leads to complete loss of structure and money for the investor. Go to the next page, please. Why Sunrise Floaters? Uh, we've actually scoured the market uh, and looked at all the competing designs, all the competing products, and there are just some key features when it comes to Sunrise Floaters. Uh, and this is one of the main reasons we're, we're going to be outlining over here, uh, that this is the only floater that hasn't failed um, in the market. Uh, when it comes to buoyancy, you know, we've tried to come side by side versus a classical design which is uh, a pillow type floater it is really susceptible to toppling over because the buoyancy is very low sunrise buoyancy products uh, sun, sunrise products have a much higher buoyancy to the range of 30 to 50 percent uh, the concept of uh, the floater is also totally different different. We are a pipe structure based concept versus a blow molded concept when it comes to the pillow floaters when it comes to tilt angle uh, the sunrise product range actually it gives you opportunity to tune uh, bases your location um, the 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 tilt from 15 degrees to 30 degrees whereas the competitor can only stick with a, a, a standard tilt of let's say 11 degrees when it comes to anchoring experience i mentioned before sunrise comes from a long history of anchoring in deep water deep sea and raging seas and they have all of that anchoring know-how and experience this allows them to actually reduce anchor locations on uh, one island by a factor of eight so if the competitor has eight mooring lines uh, we just have one and uh, that also reduces the risk of uh, of failure for the plant owners go to the next page please some of the other issues which are there with the existing products uh, in the market there's a ton of linkages uh, in in every uh, floater and one floater holds only one uh, pv module so so actually, you're looking at about eight links per panel. Um, and when it comes to our floater design, uh, we actually have four links for a complete floater. And that means we only have about 0.5 links per panel. So this logically just reduces the risk of failure, um, apart from the fact that our link actually holds up to 10 times the loading criteria of the other competing products. One of the key effects with the Sunrise floater design is that there is a big cooling effect uh, that comes into into play here our floaters um, ensures that the pv module is actually offset from the water level which allows for a lot of air to actually you know flow up under the module hence reducing the temperature of the module as compared to the competitor where it's a block design there is no airflow and the temperature of the module goes up and the efficiencies go down there's been studies conducted by the Kagawa government in, in Japan, as well as Ceres in, in uh, Singapore, which clearly show that designs, uh, our product uh, actually performs to the level of about 3% higher yield as compared to competition. And that's one of the biggest advantages that we can, we can bring to the market. When it comes to water level variation, because of, I would say, inefficient designs in their anchoring systems, they just cannot handle uh, the amount amount of water level variations that we can again it comes back from design experience uh, and know-how which exists with the sunrise team in taiwan go to the next page please quality is absolutely of up utmost important to us we believe in quality we actually provide warranty to the tune of 25 years where customers are simply asking us for a 10-year warranty our raw material is warranted for 50 years of use uh, for these kind of applications outdoor applications over water applications uh, the material has been certified in singapore in taiwan um, for actually using with drinking water so that tells you how safe uh, the product is there is no leaching effects and of course there is no aging effects in our material at all
from the rest is we can actually tailor make uh, our design solution catered to your exact application. So there are instances uh, with the Sunrise Floater where you actually see dry land on uh, uh, as well as uh, water, uh, you know, being experienced by the floater in the same pond and that's that's basically competency that just does not exist in the market we can handle water reservoirs with unstable embankments we can handle deep lakes with complex anchoring technologies and we can also handle still water areas in flowing rivers and this is something that just does not exist exist with the with our competitors in the market and this is a big edge for us this is going to help us actually penetrate the market mainly in central india where you see a lot of seasonal dry fall as well as heavy monsoon go to the next page so we actually offer the lowest cost of total ownership uh, uh, we actually offer a lot more value through higher yields. And this is actually a study that we've conducted uh, over the course of uh, an RFP or an RFQ, which we are working on over the last two quarters. Uh, so even though our initial capex is higher, uh, through all the simulation work and uh, data collection work, we have actually proven that from our floater, uh, due to the tilt angle variation, we actually produce about 1 to 1.5% higher yield as compared to competitors. And when it comes to cooling effects, we actually can go up from 2.5 to 5% of extra energy yield. So for developers, for owners of the plants, we are by far the, the most valuable solution out there because, yeah, we have initial capex, which is slightly higher, but with our design and our cooling effects, the value that we bring to you and the total cost of ownership really jumps down and we can compete with anybody else in the market. Go to the next page, please. India, there's there's been a lot of pressure on on price. India is a highly highly price sensitive market, and uh, we've actually used a lot of uh, our local know how of how the market works, and worked a lot with the design team out in Taiwan to reduce the co cost of uh, our entire solution, um, almost to the tune of about thirty percent reduction. We, so we've constantly innovated uh, innovated ourselves just upon entering the market. We've come up with floating walkways. Uh, as compared to all competitors having still walkways. We also have modular walkways, which are basically uh, walkways which you can physically pick up and relocate as per your uh, use uh, for heavy maintenance work. And with this, we've been able to really reduce the number of walkways in our system. Can you go to the next page, please? So if you look at this slide, uh, on the left, you would see uh, a standard system which is being sold by Sunrise all over the world. There's a main walkway vertically and then there are maintenance walkways going across horizontally and that's the number of walkways which we are actually eliminating with our indian uh, product line we've actually come up with floating walkways which you can see here uh, we have come up with modular walkways which is basically going to be just one row uh, across an island which then which can then be moved uh, to different locations on a plant. And this is the kind of cost optimization that we believe in uh, and we've really not cut any corners on our raw material choices We've not cut, our, cut any corners on our testing, validation, process, investment, none of that. We've actually focused mainly on exactly what the consumer needs and give it to him rather than over-engineering the product or uh, over-designing the product. Go to the next page. So what's what's next uh, with SLTI? We are we are focused on on innovating in this market. We want to be market leaders, and we are going to showcase that with the new technology that we bring. Already we. We've kind of through this presentation shown you that there is no competition there for us when it comes to a reliability, second energy generation, and then the entire value of owning uh, the project uh, when it comes to uh, the safety aspects also. Uh, when we come to the newer technologies which are in development and in uh, deployment in Taiwan, uh, there's actually a much higher sense of cost saving that we can bring uh, to the customer. Uh, basically, today there is about eight modules per float, uh, which is uh, oriented in a portrait mode. And in the future, we are actually in the near future, I would say in 2021, we want to start pitching this new technology floater uh, in which we've actually not changed the length of the floater as much. Uh, we've just tuned the, the thicknesses of the pipe uh, and optimized the buoyancy to actually be able to handle about 12 modules per float 
And this is really going to help in improvement of yield and energy generation per square kilometer. And it's going to give us the best in class anchoring and mooring capability. Go to the next page, please. So to summarize, we are superior when it comes to engineering. We do minimize risk. We absolutely optimize returns from extra yield and we have all the technology available to safeguard the investors interest and also generate extra yield some of the key aspects i would like to just summarize here in the table our material life cycle is 50 years to the competitors 20 years warranty period is 25 years versus the competitor at 10 years the tilt angle variations is is tunable up to 30 30 degrees versus the competitor can just go maybe 11 or 12 degrees and that's a fixed offer from them the yield ratios proven, tested by Japanese government is 3%. By Ceres government is going up to 5% uh, by Singapore uh, Ceres Institute. There is proven wind speed resistance with our system. Uh, the competitors are failing at less than 41 meters per second. And we have actually proven ourselves with a 10 minute average of 47.5 uh, meter per second wind speed with the Maggie Typhoon in Taiwan. Our anchor location brake loads are about 3,200 kgs versus a competitor of 800 kgs. And two floats uh, connection braking load is a factor of 10x. So that's the amount of safety in our design. That's how relevant we are to this market. Uh, and the biggest key point is that we consume about 25% less surface area uh, to generate the same amount of electricity that our competitor would. So that just tells you about the material efficiency, how good we are for the environment, and actually you could actually pack a far more um, number of PV modules with our system. We do give metallic structures as a standard as compared to competitors who just uh, keep it as an optional offer. The anchoring location are, as I explained earlier, one eighth of our competitive competition. And when it comes to ability to handle waves, our standard design can handle about 1.5 meter, and a special design can go up to as, as, as much as 3.5 meters uh, versus the comp uh, competition at about one meter. So, hands down, uh, Sunrise Technology, uh, which we've brought to India, is the number one player in this market. They've just been, um, you know, they've just been uh, missing uh, uh, the edge to actually market this into India. And with SLTI, we are bringing this to the country. Please stay uh, connected with us. We are actually working in Taiwan. Very hard on a special things presenting uh, with this great group of people here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for a wonderful presentation. So, um, we can take a few questions now in case anyone wants to uh, have a small QA. Uh, but we're also starting very soon with our investors' birthday. So, in case anyone is interested um, to go ahead and join that, that, that is completely okay. If anyone has any questions, you can please write it on the chat or maybe unmute yourself um, and ask questions. Okay. Um, so I have a quick question to first solar. So what is the future um, of thin film solar panels with silicon having a dominant market share now? Do we have someone from first solar? Okay, I'm uh, just gonna move on. Uh, we have a question to ISRO. Um, is, is ISRO willing to work with Indian solar manufacturers to design high temperature resistant solar panels? Temperature solar panels for our uh, upcoming Venus missions. Uh, yes, we would be uh, interested in uh, working with uh, the local industry if uh, you can send us a proposal uh, and we can look forward to working with you. 
All right, great. Thank you. Um, and I have one more question for IEA PVPS. Uh, do we have someone from there still on the video uh, on the call? Okay, I think Peter has left. He did uh, write it at the beginning. Um, okay, so I think that is all the questions that we have right now. Uh, I'm just going to wait for one or two more minutes in case anyone else has any questions. Otherwise, uh, we can all go ahead, log off, and maybe log on to the investors' conclave, which is also just started. Kanika, uh, Krishna Priya yes, here. Uh, you can pl please share my uh, email ID to the person who asked that specific question. Sure. Uh, I would also suggest, uh, I would also suggest everyone uh, in case they want to leave their um, in case they want to leave their uh, uh, contact details in the chat box for everyone, you can go ahead and do that. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes uh, to do that. 